Hello and welcome to my first vlog of this week, the second week of September 2021. I've actually already recorded this video once before and put it up for a little while on YouTube, but unfortunately you couldn't see any of the Excel data. So that was annoying and I'm not too familiar with YouTube yet how to fix that. I could see it on the initial recording, but not on the upload. But rather than try to fix it, when I looked at the video a little bit, I thought, you know, I'm not too happy with that. So I'll just go and re-record it and flesh things out a little bit and structure it a little bit better. So that's where we are. Anyway, this topic is going to be about project managing your hobby or specifically in this case, Battletech. Now, I'm... <sighs> I don't say I'm a project manager because I'm not really. I work in like comms and PR, but I do quite a lot of project management and I work with a lot of good project managers. So this is very much like project management with the tiniest of P's because it's not really project management. Project management is really quite like a serious topic that you get some people who are incredibly good at it and then you get some people who are terrible at it. So there's a bit of an art to project management and it's also very important. So the project management that I do, if I get it wrong or when somebody that I hire gets it wrong, people tend to just get on with their lives, right? Because it's like administrational. But if you get like the project management of a building wrong, you forget to put aircon in, best case scenario, worst case scenario, the building falls down. So that's very serious. So project management in of itself is, is a very important thing. It's a very good life skill, I'd say. I I tend to hire people that have got project management experience, even if it's like a relatively small project, if they show that they can deliver something like beginning to end and they've got some kind of cohesive result at the end of it, that tells me a lot about that person and their like organizational skills. Now, this is obviously hobby. So do you necessarily want to attach some like formal regime to your hobby? Probably not, but I think it's good to get some order to your hobby because of how much you are dealing with and how much resource and time and space this hobby takes up, which you could say that about any hobby. Yeah, like it, it's not exclusive to like miniatures by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I think hobbying as we know it is relatively simple and not actually that expensive. I've I think I talked about this on a on a previous video. Like I've got friends who have way more elaborate and expensive hobbies than I have. And my hobby tends to kind of dominate a lot of my time, but it certainly doesn't dominate a lot of my money. So that's good for me. It means I can save more money, but obviously it's each their own. You do whatever you want with your money. But I think project management can really help to some extent. Or like I said, I, I might stop calling it project management because that's quite, quite clickbaity of me to even call this video project management. It's basically just like Excel organizing, just so you can see or have a an overview of what you have got, what your paint schemes are, and more importantly, what you want to do with the hobby as an end result. So. I'm going to talk about two things as like topics here. So, and I'll tell you what those are straight away and then I'll get into them and flesh them all out over the course of the video. So the first one is about the resources available to you. And I've touched on this already. And as far as I can always see with hobbies, you've kind of got three and that's money, time and space. There may be others in other hobbies, but when I'm kind of deciding upon a new hobby project project I want to know kind of ballpark how much it's how much it's going to cost me because if I'm running like hobbies side by side I've always got that thing in my mind of like I don't want to spend a ludicrous amount of money on this which I never do but I always got that factored in just as a as a resource which is very very sensible to do even you know, if you're coming at this with, or going to throw a lot of cash at it, or you are, you know, cash rich and you've got a lot of disposable income. If you don't, you know, if you're on limited budget, then this becomes very important because it really kind of, you get the maximum out of it for the minimal cost, which is obviously beneficial. Time is the next one. And time is something that I, I'm personally fine with now because 
since the whole COVID lockdown thing, as with most people, my social life died a complete death. And I was quite a socially active person. Like I used to travel quite a lot. You know, I used to go down to work in London, worked in Leeds quite often. So I used to go out quite often. And when COVID hit, my time as a resource just went through the roof. And thats it's no coincidence that I've completed more projects over the last 18 months than you know I ever have done in my life. And I think a lot of people will say that. And it's one reason why, say, companies like Games Workshop are making so much money, because demand for their products has gone up because it's an indoor hobby and we're all stuck indoors, or we, we certainly have been for, for quite a long time now. Now, time again, obviously, is completely, it's going to be very personal to you. So it's not just about work. It's about, like, family commitments and everything else, life in general. So factor that in as well. Like, you don't want to kind of give yourself too much to do if you know it's going to take you four years to do it because you'll probably be thinking, after two years of that, I'm getting itchy feet to do something else now or maybe I want to you know, try another hobby. So I'd give yourself like an attainable goal. I usually try to put time limitations on myself. Now that with Battletech, that's been quite difficult because I've been waiting for the Kickstarter. So that basically the hobby goes on ice, you know, for that duration. The third one, which is space, which is something that again, it kind of ties to money a little bit because you probably, the, the amount of disposable income you have probably has some kind of correlation to how much space you have available to you. Not necessarily, but possibly, probably. I can't say it really does to me because I probably live in a smaller house than I could afford. So I've got less space than I probably should have because I don't necessarily want to move to a lavish house I'll wait until I retire and then I'll probably do that I'm quite happy living in a, a modest house up until you know I, I feel the need to kind of get something more elaborate but I've still got space right like space is something that I can make I've said before that I don't want to like commit a room or a, you know like a big chunk of my, my property over to hobby I like to keep it self-contained so that it's within like a storage section of my house. And then if I have people over to play, I can basically have a, I have a game on a really quite a big kitchen table. So that works for me. I know some people will like to kind of build their own terrain boards and, and things like that. Then space becomes a, a real factor in this because you might have like a workshop and you can just put a ton of stuff in there. But the chances are you can't do that or you don't want to do that like I don't. So space becomes a factor and that's the the one thing that I really impose on myself like as a almost like a curtailing of my hobby so and I'll talk about that one when I kind of go through the excel that's on the screen here a little bit but those three three factors are what you are dealing with I think and it's good to kind of have a an idea of those three functions or those three metrics before you really kind of push forth and start buying things because you might find that you just start throwing money at something and you're wasting money and I've certainly done that on the hobby before and that's really before I got into the mindset of well it's best to kind of keep some order to this in order to kind of minimize um, those three factors you know money time and space. Now, the great thing about our hobby is that if you do make a mistake, eBay, right? Like I sell a ton of stuff on eBay and I usually do it, I don't say, this is going to sound very moralistic, but I usually do it quite conscientiously. Like I really don't like the whole, I'm going to put something on here for a lot of money because I know someone wants to buy it. I'll use the auction system so something might go for a lot of money, but it always goes. It always sells. And I often say this to people who do hobbies. Like, even, no matter how much money it costs, this isn't like having a drink binge hobby, right? Where you go out on a Friday and Saturday night and throw a hundred pounds or dollars against a wall for alcohol, a kebab, and a taxi ride. Yeah, what we buy is actually can actually go up in value. In fact, it often does go up in value. So there is a return on investment to some extent. I mean, I've certainly seen that in the Kickstarter from Battletech um, very recently, which I got, because there's a lot of stuff in that Kickstarter that I don't want and I'll sell on. You, things like the the cards for the game, which are really nice, like they look great, 
I, someone else might enjoy might enjoy them. I'm not going to use them. So I put them on eBay, and you'll probably find that they'll go for like between five and twenty quid. And I've got lots of these card sets, so I'll probably make back like quite a good chunk of money that I spent on the Kickstarter just from being able to sell stuff on YouTube on on uh, eBay. Sorry. So think about that as well. Like it's this isn't a wasted hobby. Um, in a lot of respects you can have an army and sell that army and for for a considerable amount of money especially if you paint it quite well you might be able to kind of sell it more for, than it than it's actually worth i mean i think there are some stats on this with like games workshop miniatures and plastics that they're actually worth their weight in silver so i mean you know and again they don't necessarily depreciate in value especially in the long run like you see some old hammer stuff now goes for a fortune because it's collectible, they don't make it anymore, so it's very limited. So there is there are some factors in this that are slightly more complex than you could probably, you know, give it credit for at first instance, which is oh, I'm spending forty pounds on some plastic. Like it, it is it is more complicated than that. So in terms of the second point that I'm I'm going to raise, and I'll I'll do this um, throughout this video really is, what do you want out of the hobby in regards your collection? So, for instance, are you a competitive player? So, there are going to be models, for instance, that are much better than others if you're a competitive player. So, I'm, I, now I'm not, so I'm, I've not documented any of that in this video. This is very, like, law specific which I'll get into when I get into the meat of it. But if you're, like, all about the competition and you know that you want options. Now, for Battletech, this is quite a complex topic because there are certain mechs that everyone seems to really like and there are certain mechs that people don't like but then there's all the subjectivity surrounding that as well and it also becomes a massive factor in terms of what era you're playing for instance if you're playing like 3025 end of the succession war end of the third succession war era i think the general consensus is you don't want to bring mechs with too much ammo because there's no case ammo Mechs with ammo tend to go boom very, very quickly, or there's a good chance of them going boom. Um, I think mechs, you know, that are usually like rocking PPCs tend to be more popular. I'd imagine, anyway, I don't play competitive Battletech, but I'm just looking at that from like my mindset and, and how, how I know the rules. As you get into like the clan invasion, that will change considerably. So you're prob probably looking at that, like battle value for damage ratio, you know, heat management, things like that. So if you're playing competitively, this process becomes really quite complex and intricate. And you can do all manner, and I've seen people do this, of where they'll kind of number crunch things and say like, oh, well, this mech's got like an 86% ratio on X, and that makes it 3% more efficient than the mech over here. So if you're a competitive player, you probably do this anyway, so there's no point in me giving you any kind of advice on that because you'll know way more about it than I do. This is kind of a start of video in terms of how project management can help you with your hobby. So competitive players slightly outside of this, but it does become very important. Then you've got people who want to collect it for like games with their friends, right? So you're just like, okay, well, I'll collect X and you collect Y and then we'll have a battle or we'll run a, a campaign or something like that. And then you, I think at that point you're in the kind of realm of, well, I want to choose my army, they choose their army, and, army, and you might go like 50-50 on the terrain. In Battletech, you might be using the hex maps, for, hex maps sorry, because they're cheap and because they're very easy to kind of store because they're, they've got those like, um, I don't know, there's some kind of rubber mats or they've got like the paper mats or whatever. I don't use those, I use real terrain, real terrain. 3D terrain. So depends what you're really doing on that front as well. And terrain could factor into your project. I personally do have a terrain sheet that I keep, but it's separate to this. This is basically just mechs. Um, I don't even use tanks in this. Uh, I didn't bother because I, I basically bulk bought the tanks and I knew what I wanted to do with them and they were, there weren't that many. I mean, I think I got maybe, I don't know, about 35 tanks and VTOLs, and I knew pretty much exactly how I wanted to paint them. So they didn't need the complexity that this needs. And the reason why there's some complexity in this, and which I'll go on to show you, it's not on this tab, it's, it's on a future tab that I'll show you, is because I wanted things to be law appropriate. So I wanted kind of the factions that use certain mechs to have 
access to certain mechs when I paint them up, so they'll be flying that like factions colours. And the reason that I really wanted to go down the law route was because Battletech in the UK is not a, a very prominent game at all. In fact, I would probably be surprised if I can find many people who know what it is. I, people know what it is because of me and like my friend circle, but I think generally, I've talked about this before, 40k is king, Warhammer is king. Battletech's a very American IP. So if I'm kind of introducing people to this game, I want to introduce them to the whole aspect of the game, not just like the competitive side of it or the rule side of it, but the law side of it as well. So I can kind of hit that discussion off with them. For instance, like a certain mech might not be available to a certain faction for reasons, and I've kind of factored that in into what I want to do. Now, let's get into this anyway. So we'll go to the, the Excel sheet and have a look. Now, this is, when I talked about my space kind of restriction, which is very much self-imposed, you can see here on the top that I've got faction type, um, and then I've got total space of 198. Now, so give or take 200. That's that's my limit on max. The second I go over that limit, I know that I'm kind of in hoarder territory, and I'm going to have to buy another display case, which I don't particularly want to do. So 200 is fine. That's Even that is incredibly excessive. And considering that, what, six months ago, I had no max, and now I've got about 90, and then over the next few months, I'll be picking up um, like a, probably another 60 or thereabouts. So that's a lot of mechs, and you do not need that for Battletech. I want to be very clear about that point. Like Battletech is not really an expensive game at all. It's a very affordable game. It's what makes it appealing. And you can get away if you just want to play 3025. I mean, let's take out the equation that you it is rule, it is uh, miniatures agnostic, sorry. So you can play with bottle top caps if you want. If you want the experience, though, like the immersive experience, and you like to do the painting, then you're probably going to go and buy yourself like a lance of mechs. So that's $25 or about £25, £30. And you might be able to get like an old hex map, map or even make your own hex map. Um, and you can then basically, as long as you've got some dice and you've got the rule book, I'm sure that like the rules are, for Battletech are super old, right? So like they're not... I've got like the Total Warfare book, I've got the new rules and everything else, but I'm sure that, I mean, I can, you know, the people that, the, the custodians of Battletech are not like, you know, all about copyright protection and things like that. I think it's a game that is so old and it's generally not changed. I just don't think that they'd care. I mean, I, I don't know because I've got the rules, but I'm pretty sure you'll be able to find a copy of it somewhere or a friend who can introduce you with a game has got an old copy lying around or you can get one on eBay for you know, a very small amount of money. So, you know, like it, it's something where you could probably get into Battletech for, you know, under $100 quite easily. If you share it with like a friend, you might be talking about fifty dollars each. It is effectively a skirmish game. It's Battletech at its core. Like there is the you, you can play as big as you want. You can play the big like campaigns, or you can do like the ones where you're in space with like the drop ships fighting each other. But if you're just playing like hex map, traditional old school Battletech, it's cheap and it's cheerful. And the rules are actually pretty easy. Like there, there's there are some complexities, but. It's not a particularly tough game to pick up. So if I'm going to be teaching people that as well, like, again, I want to, um, you know, keep keep it law specific, but I'm going on a tangent, so I'm going to get back on track. So cause that's, that's for later in the video. For now, though, we're talking about space. So my, my f way of thinking about this is I want to have, like, a relatively balanced army or armies across the board. So you can see here by these numbers, the inner sphere will end up with 52 mechs, the minor and periphery powers will end up with 32, the clans will end up with 48, and the dust counters, who are my um, mercenary outfit, will end up with 24. And the dust counters are my kind of competitive team. So if I do ever go the competitive route, there are mechs in there that I like to play, either because I've written law for them, which I want to, you know, reflect that in, in what I'm doing with this project. 
but also I, I've got certain mocks in there that are, mechs in there that are quite crunchy and can like hold their own on the battlefield or reflect my style of play because I tend to play quite. I, I'm not a standard battletech player. I think a lot of battletech players just like to bring like the heaviest mechs. That might be unfair. It's probably not true, but for me, I tend to bring like jump capable mechs and I, I like the like maneuverable mechs. Why I kind of play Davian as a force. When I'm playing like one of the Inner Sphere, oh, that's my kind of faction of choice for the simple reason that uh, Davian tend to bring like medium mechs that are more that do have like a maneuverability, like the Enforcer, which is like junk capable but rocks an AC 10. So, yeah, I've kind of reflected that in the, the, the competitive element is reflected slightly in the Dust Counters, but it's absolutely not in any other faction. For instance, the Lyrans have like way more assault mechs than the Capellans because the Capellans are like a pretty ropey industrial power and the you know the lyrans are the lyrans are the industrial might of the battletech universe or galaxy so i've reflected that and i'll, I'll go into that um shortly so that's the kind of space thing factored in there time i'm not going to really deal with in this because i tend to be um a bit of a weirdo when it comes to painting models. I mean, I'll put it to you this way: I got the the um, the BattleTech Kickstarter on Saturday, and I've already painted about thirty models for it, and I've still been working. So that's like staying up late into the evening painting. <laughs> um, so time for me is um, it's something that I'm probably going to have less of over the next year because I've actually just switched jobs. So I'm working. For another law firm now and that will mean that i'm now with covid easing up i'll probably go into london quite a bit i might be doing some international travel so my time might limit itself you know but I, I, with covid i think we, we we are probably going to be in a position where i can envisage lockdowns again over the the like winter months so i might be back like hermit crabbing it and uh you know painting as much as i can and, and doing it far too quickly and then running out of things to do um but at the moment like the kickstarter is only about uh it's not not quite half of the models um that i want so i've still got quite a lot to collect so I'll, i should be able to kind of get these things at retail um which segues me quite nicely to the second box here which is just going into the money side of it so this is a list of i believe all the um the purchase options for wave two and this is so i basically just the, the name that I, now this you know could be quite useful because i can't see this anywhere online uh, i'm sure it exists somewhere i'm sure someone's like put it on reddit or, or something like that it's somewhere but um that's a list of every mech for every like force pack and its tonnage level and how many i'm going to buy the price is a complete estimate because i don't know what they're going to cost you i'm guessing if they're like the wave one stuff it'll be between $25 for a lance pack so about £30 um, there might be like for instance the Comstar one should probably be more expensive because it's 5 mechs, Clan Stars as well have 5 mechs so and they, these ones are bigger right like you've got like the Bayamoth in there and the Takina so they might be like more expensive, I don't know, I've got no idea on their pricing but I've kind of guesstimated it to be about in and around £400 that's completely reasonable I, I mean you know i say this for myself for nobody else but if they could double the price on that it wouldn't bother me i think the models are brilliant and i quite like supporting catalysts and what they've done so i think that this again it's testament to how like not greedy this company are like the, the models are great the little packs look fantastic and i can see they'll do very well hopefully at retail they're getting a lot of these as well so i think from the last comms that i saw on the uh, on the Kickstarter page, I think all these lands packs are getting between seven and a half, seven and a half thousand, and ten thousand reprints outside of the Kickstarter that should hopefully be going live in November and December 2021. And from what my understanding is of what they've said, so I'm just going on their word here, that will give them stock well into 2022, which is amazing because if there are any new players coming into Battletech, there's going to be a product line for them to purchase if that they clear that and it starts gaining traction they'll then presumably have the bit of wave three which they can then do reprints again if and see what the demand's like for wave two so they'll have lots of nice figures to fall back on 
So effectively, everything that you see there is what you will be able to buy from November and December on for several months. But definitely don't wait. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be trying to buy this stuff in... I don't know, like September 2022, because it's probably going to have run out by then, and the only things that will be available are on eBay. But if you are interested in getting into the hobby and you can see maybe a couple of the uh, the, the packs that you want there, there's also the, the Wave 1 stuff as well, so there are several other packs I've not included here because I've got all that through the Kickstarters. So this is just for the Wave 2 stuff. But again, if you are of a mind to do that, the date is there and you can kind of get a, a gauge of the cost. So if you are going to kind of dip your toe into this, you might want to buy something like the... A good one, I think, would be like the Inner Sphere Urban Lands. So, like the top one there, which is the Victor, the Hunchback, the Enforcer, and the Raven. That's really, really quite a solid lance. I mean, that's my lance of choice, I think, in this entire pack. Um, oh, and you could then get, you know, like the clan variant as well. I think if I, if I was going for a clan variant on this, I'd definitely get the one with the Beam off, which that's a Stone Rhino, is it? Um, yeah, that makes a beast. That's beautiful. I mean, but this is a very, like, I mean, this is an incredible one. Behemoth, Supernova, Marauder 2C, a Warhammer 2C, and a Hunchback 2C are nuts. I mean, that's that's just, I can't even imagine what the battle value will be on that. It will be crazy. So, yeah. Now, why I've done this is, like, this is my kind of rationale into how much, first of all, to tell me kind of how much money is going to be spent on this just so I can keep track on it with my other kind of Excel sheets, like if I'm doing it for terrain or other projects or things like that. Just so I know it's not spiraling into an addiction. <laughs> so, you know, $400. I mean, given that I paid for the Kickstarter, like back in, what, October 2020? And since then, I bought quite a lot of terrain for Battletech. And I bought some, like I did buy a game of Armored Combat and a version of the clan version that I found on eBay. But on the whole, I've like you know not spent much really. You know, well, I probably spent like several hundred pounds on the like terrain and, and some box sets. So I feel like I can like fill my boots now and like go and purchase all this when it comes out. It'll be a nice Christmas treat for me. So yeah, like it, it's one of those situations where you have to kind of gauge your own like resources on this what and, and again what are you wanting to get out of it in terms of um like are you going to be introducing people to this game are you playing competitively and then factoring all that in with the, the three factors that i've discussed so i think i've been going on for for a, a little while now but i've got a little bit more to talk about because i really want to kind of run through my project in terms of what mechs i've got so we're going to start with the Inner Sphere tab here. So this is a list of all the, the five Inner Sphere powers. Now I've kind of, uh, and com, the com, the com Guard as well, obviously they're very important to this, but um, we'll talk about all of these uh, separately just for, for a little while. So I came to the conclusion with the amount of mechs and space and money and everything else that I wanted to factor into this that Comsguard were going to get 12 mechs because I wanted to be able to run three lances in case I ever migrate to Alpha Strike. Now, at the moment, I don't. At the moment, I play classic battle tech. But if I ever do the Alpha Strike thing, it's probably going to be like the clan inv invasion era. And it's going to be like a couple of um, stars versus like three lances from the, the Comsguard or something like that. So I wanted to give them a few more options. They've also got very specific mechs. So like the Black Knight, which is known as the Clan Buster. Uh, Black Knight, I re that obviously really has to go to the comms guard. So that's why the, they are getting the the, um, the Black Knight. There are other options in there as well as like a military force that are important. So they've got archers because archers are basically long range missile platforms. And you can kind of, you know, in terms of if this was a real military, they'd want that option, right? In terms of assault mechs, I've kind of ditched them with the Marauder 2, which I'm really not a fan of. I don't like the Marauder 2 at all. I don't like the design of it. I, I think it's quite a lazy design because it's just basically a like a, a bulky Marauder, which upsets me because I love the Marauder. I just wish they'd have designed, just make a new mech, right? Like, leave the Marauder alone, please. And they do that quite a lot, especially, it's one reason why I'm really turned off by the latter 
kind of ages in Battletech because it's like they've run out of ideas and everything just gets rehashed. I mean, I saw a hideous thing the other day. It was like a they'd gone over a hundred tons. It was like a hundred and thirty-five ton thing on a tripod. I was up. Oh, no, no, no. This is heresy. Uh, <laughs> hundred ton is the max. Like you end up like the. One of the worst things that I've seen recently is the third Star new Star Wars film, which I almost walked out of the cinema on because it is just like, I mean, it's horrifying. I mean, it's just like, how much junk can we fr throw at the screen at you and space battles that don't mean anything, a million ships over here, a million, it, and it, I, I'm like, with Battletech, I'm like, D don't, don't do that. Right, like keep it, keep the rules of your universe very solidified so that everybody knows where they stand, and then you build your narratives in the gaming system around those rules. I'm really strict on that, and I hate it when game designers go out of that. And I know why they do it because they want to sell more products, but I just believe that there's a much more sophisticated way to do it. The Marauder 2 is like, to me, it's like the start of the rot. With where Battle Battletech took a lot of wrong turns in like their what they were doing in terms of the fluff, so I basically panned the two Marauder twos off on on comms guards because I don't want them. Like generally, I think it's a mech associated with the Davins and the Steiners, so and I don't want them in those forces because they're forces that are quite dear to my heart, and I don't like the Marauder two. So therefore, the comms guards got them. And I really wish they'd have changed that option. You know, like I wish we didn't we weren't getting the Marauder two. I would have much, I would have far preferred them to do uh, like the Annihilator or something. The Annihilator, I love. I mean, that's like a big Cthulhu monster. So um, that and that's a hundred ton mech. I think they are, uh, someone commented um, in one of the other videos that they felt that the that, oh, they'd heard they were doing the Annihilator in in the Wave three. So that's great news for me. Cause I, do, I do love the Annihilator. It's just a big walking Daka Daka cannon. It's like four AC tens. It's amazing. Anyway, so that's comms guard. So they're very much like a military force, as you'd expect. So they've got options for like maneuverability, LRMs, PPCs. You know, pretty much everything. I think the one thing that they don't really have is the big AC cannons, and I think that's law appropriate. So I'd imagine going into like the Battle of Tuki, you're gonna you're going to want to run PPCs against clans because PPCs don't have ammo that can explode. So Probably a reflective choice of this. that's why Comstar won because they were a smart military outfit. Um, anyway, I'm just I'm going to very quickly now because I'm pretty conscientious of time. I'm going to go through each of these quickly just to kind of discuss again why I've chosen these mechs for this and how it's going to work. So every Inner Sphere faction is getting eight mechs. That's so that I can pick two lances. So again, if I want to migrate to to Alpha Strike, I'm, every force has two options. But if you're just playing classic Battletech and you need a lance, I've then got like the, the big boy option. So like if we go look at like the Lyran Commonwealth there, there's an Atlas, a Battlemaster, a Zeus and a Victor, which is like quintessentially very stereotypical of the Lyran Commonwealth, right? That's, they just love their big assault mechs. And then, I mean, they very, very rarely run light mechs, but I have given them one option, which is the Wolfhound, which is very much their specific mech. And it's a very late mech as well in terms of when I'm playing it. So I won't be playing the Wolfhound in 3025. Uh, that's a, basically a clan invasion mech. The Fed Sons are a, a, a unit, I've already alluded to this, but they generally use medium mechs. Now, I didn't want to just fill them out with medium mechs because eventually there is a, um, a civil war between them and the Lyran Commonwealth when um, Fedcom basically dissolve and, and go to war with each other. So I wanted to give them some decent, a uh, two decent assault mechs so that if when they go up against the Lyrans in my kind of narrative play, they're going to have some assault options. And that's the Night Star and the Victor. And the Night Star is a terrifying mech. So I think it's like double Gauss rifles. So it's amazing. And it looks fantastic. And it's a mech that you associate with the um, like Federated Sons and the Lyran Commonwealth. So it makes sense that they get it. But generally they've got a lot of uh, medium mix in there, Enforcer, Centurion, Trebuchet. Um, the Bushwhacker, the Hatchet Man, and the Wolfhound are all uh, like not later mechs. The, the Hatchet Man's are, like, yeah, I've got the date here for the, so I know where I'm going to be playing them. Um, I should probably have talked about that. Yeah, so 
I've got number here, so the number of the mechs um, that will be involved in the force, the date of creation of the mech, whether it's jump capable, because I just like to know that so that I can see it at a glance. I don't want to give like a faction no jump capable mechs, for instance, and the tonnage rate there. So yeah, that's again very much a, a that that is a very typical Fed Sons force, I'd say. You know, I mean, if you're playing like thirty twenty five, if you saw like a an enforcer, a centurion, a trebuchet, um, and a victor in Fed Sons, that that's they love their big AC weaponry, and the centurion um, is and the enforcer very much reflect that. The trebuchet is obviously the LRM option because they're a very competent military, so they've got options. The Free Worlds League is... I'm not that familiar with Free Worlds League law other than certain things. So I know they like Hunchbacks, so they got both the Hunchbacks. Um, they do... T I think the Stalker Factory. The Stalker's the big 85-ton um, LRM spam mech. I think that's in Free Worlds League ter territory, so they got that. The one thing I know about the Free Worlds League is that they have a shortage of PPCs. So I've basically... I don't think there is one PPC there. In, I'm talking about the the stock variants of these mechs as well. I'm not if I'm going to be introducing people to this game and playing with them. I'm not going to be introducing weird and wacky variants of mechs. They're going to be getting what's on the record sheets, right? Because that looks good and that I can introduce them to the game and it's more balanced. So that's why I'm doing that. The Draconis Combine, um, who are the for me always the quintessential antagonist, especially like in the Succession Wars. But I really like the Draconis coming out. They're a really interesting faction. And I really... The King Crab, which is very much a clan buster mech. Like that's what the, that should be in Comstar, really. Or the Comgard, sorry. But I've given it to the Draconis Combine because the King Crab is absolutely evil looking. And it's an insanely powerful mech. So if I'm going to be running them as like antagonists, I want them to be a proper threat. Especially on narrative play. Like if I've got people in this game and the way I'm going to paint... Sorry, I've got people coming to play this game with me... I want to run a Draconis Combine Lance and I want it to look terrifying. So I'm going to paint them all like, as you'd expect, black and red. They're going to look quite sinister. And if you rock in the King Crab, I mean, like one of the most terrifying options in Battletech. They've also, very like lore appropriately, they've got two dragons, a panther and a genus. Like they're very much mechs associated uh, with the Draconis Combine. Um, also got good military options like the Grasshopper and the Archer. Like the Grasshopper is a really good mech, and it's a jump capable seventy ton mech, so that straight away makes it not unique, but there aren't that many jump capable heavy mechs, so it gives it another option. And the Capellans, which I actually like playing the Capellans because it's quite like um, a, it's a challenge because they. And that's why I say I'm going law specific here, so. I got two Vindicators from the old models because they've got this like really dynamic pose, the old model. So they're like, it's like a running Vindicator, so it looks really cool. Um, and I like having some old models in here because it gives the kind of force, forces a little bit of variety. I've also kept it like applicable to the law. So like Capellans tend to not have much industrial might. So the fact they might have like old Vind Vindicator factory that's still churning out models that look older than the other mechs that are on the, the battlefield might paint them up a little bit. I've actually painted these two and they look a little bit more rustic, you know, like they've got more chewed up armour than the, the other mechs. They maybe have been in service a lot longer. They've also got the two um, Catathracts. I can always struggle with that word. Um, but the the Catathract is basically like a, a Franken mech. So it's I think it's like pieces from a Marauder and a, it's got like the armour of, of a Vindicator. But it's a very, very competent mech. It's 70 tonnes and it's got like a PPC and like really good like options on there and it's a strong tough mech so that's when they're going to be like rocking their big boys if they're bringing the, the cataracts with them but generally it's kind of a mishmash of uh like vindicators and the raven which has got special technology on it to kind of hide you from the opposition um because because that's how capellans play they're sneaky because because they've got to be because they're not as industrially powerful as the the other inner sphere powers the cyclops which is a very the Cyclops has like a the battle computer in it, I think, which gives it like extra options. Now, I always associate the Cyclops with the Capellans. I don't think that's true, though. I think I've got that from playing Mech Commander 2. So I always remember in Mech Commander 2, you were able to buy the Cyclops when you did the Capellan missions. And that... I love the Cyclops in that game. I love the Cyclops in general. It's a very, very cool-looking mech. So the Capellans have one of those varieties. The other one went to the Free Worlds League. 
Yes. So that's how that again, just to get back to my point on like project management, that to me now, I know exactly what I'm collecting. I know what's going into each force. I can get those models and I've got a very like distinctive idea of what I'm doing because it's all written down for me. I also keep a record of what I've painted. So you can see at the moment I'm painted very, very little actually on the inner sphere stuff because a lot of these mechs I don't actually have yet. So I'm kind of waiting until I get like more stuff uh, coming in that comes on retail and then I'll be, be, be able to complete my inner sphere stuff. So we'll move on now to minor um, like powers and periphery. This is a relatively simple one. So I'm going to collect um, the free Russell Hag Republic, uh, Torians, um, pirate mechs and local government mechs. And the reason why I went for Free Russell Hag Republic is because if you're gonna if you're going to play Clan Invasion, they're really the first Inner Sphere power. They're a minor power. Very interesting faction. They they were part of the Draconis Combine, but they kind of revolted against it. There was like a mini civil war, and they basically got their their freedom. And they're a, a, they're an outfit that are like very much associated with like Scandinavians. So basically like Swedes in space. Um. They also, I've given them quite interesting options on their mech lineup because if you see here, they've got two dragons, which are old models, which I've gotten painted already. As you can see from anything that's tagged in color, it means I've painted it. Um, and the, the so the two old dragons, the Panther and the Jenna, and that's because they are a Draconis Combine force, really. They don't like the Draconis Combine, they're, they're mortal enemies. But they've got factories that churn out Draconis Combine mechs. Ergo, they get two dragons, a panther, and a Jenna. And they also then get like the standard force, which I'll, I'll give to any of my like minor powers, which is a Marauder, a Warhammer, and two Riflemen. So the, the Taurians get that as well. And that's like your, not a military on a budget, but because the Warhammer's an amazing mech. The Marauder's an amazing mech as well. Riflemen, not so much, but... It's what you'd it's what you'd expect to see from a competent military that were on a not a, not a budget but they had limited options, so it's like well we'll just put give, put fifty riflemen in the battle and they can just all stand there and shoot their ACs and that will win you the war. You're not going to be able to do it with much sophistication, but it's a very like healthy like military option. Another point on that is so when I've decaled the Free Russell Hag Republic mechs so up, I've not actually I really don't like the logo. It's very weird like, like it's like a sea monster or something i don't like it at all uh so what i instead did was i used the alpha legion decals from um 40k like the chaos unit they're basically um like it's like a hydra and the head of the hydra uh, the head of the sea monster looks like the hydra so it's very very similar the reason i've done that is first of all i don't like the russell hard republic logo main reason Second reason is because if I want to play another Merc unit, right? So like a Merc unit who in the law that's not the Dust Counters, I'll just call them like the Hydra's Heads or something weird, and then they can run as that. Um, so it just gives you like a little bit of an extra option in there and saves a little bit of space, and it means that I don't have to go and like create another specific like model line for my Merc units. Not much to say about the Taurians, other than they are very typical Taurians. Like the, and I, I painted all these models actually today, and a little bit yesterday, but I finished them today. And they are, like again, it's that very stereotypical, because the, the Taurians are a very like competent military, but they, they're not going to be running like, you know, Steiner level assault mechs for the most part. So... Again, the options there are no, they're not limited at all. They're, they're there, like you got the Phoenix Hawk and the Valkyrie to take strategic positions, um, and then basically the rest of it acts as the core, and they can run two very competent lances there. The the Valkyrie, interestingly enough, is a mech that you very much associate with the Federated Sons, but because I had limited space, I only had like eight picks for Fed Sons, and I knew eventually I'd want to run a narrative campaign where they went to war with the Lyrans. I can't afford to have two of those eight picks as Valkyries. So my kind of thinking was, I'll give the the these two Valkyries to the Taurians because they are like the traditional enemies of the Fed Sons. So they've probably picked those up in Salvage or they've bought it from a factory who don't care about selling to Taurians that's like on the border or something. You know, and like maybe they're too far away from like uh, new, um, like Federated Sun Central to be controlled. So they're like, yeah, hey, yeah, we can sell... 50 Valkyries to the Taurians, even though they're our mortal enemies. So that's kind of my thinking on that. 
The Pirates got the Banshee, because the Banshee is the worst assault mech in the game, in my opinion. I mean, it's a fast mech, so that gives it some credibility, but it's loadout. is absolutely terrible for a 95-ton mech. So I thought it'd be quite amusing to give that to a pirate. Um, they've got good options. I mean, a Marauder, a Warhammer, a, a Blackjack, uh, maybe not the Blackjack, um, two Stingers and two Wasps. So it's a very like ad hoc, funky group, as you'd expect. And then the local government... Uh, a black jap an urban mech two valkyries two stingers and two wasps so that's again now i'm how i'm going to play this so i'm playing in narrative if i'm introducing someone to this game i'll probably let them choose whatever faction they like so if they say oh i really like the color blue so i'll play the lyrans i'll be like okay i'll play the pirates and then that will give them like a, an advantage over me for battle value for sure i mean especially if they're like running an atlas um but i can like play the banshee which is only five tons like lighter than the atlas but it's a hell of a lot worse so you'll give them the advantage and i can kind of you know put my pirate hat on and be like yo ho ho let me hit you up with my pirates so i wanted those in it as well just for like narrative reasons and i do love a pirate you know i like playing the pirates so that's always going to be fun and i like painting them as well because you can give them like very cliched stereotypical like colors Next up, we got the clans, and I'm not really going to say that much about the clans. I actually painted Jade Falcon today, though, which I felt absolutely filthy doing. I can't stand Jade Falcon, but they're like the evilest of evil clans. Um, but I got all that done uh, this evening. And uh, but it, yeah, I can't really say much about it because I know enough about the clans to know which certain mechs are affiliated to. For instance, I know that like the Direwolf is very much a mech associated with uh, Clan Wolf and Clan Smoke Jaguar. I think that's who I've given it to anyway. Uh, Ghost Bear have got one as well, but I think that's because I picked um, a Dire Wolf in one of the salvage packs. So I had one um, spare. So that's probably not a mech that you associate with, with Ghost Bear. But I've also, I've decided against, um, if we quickly go and have a look at the Space and Finances tab, I'm not actually going to be buying any of the Clan um, like Wave 2 stuff. It's just Wave 1 that I've got. Because I'm not a big clan player. They are the antagonists. So they certainly will be coming into play. But I'm not that bothered about them. You know, they're, kind of, they're there to kind of push the narrative on for me. Um, so, I'm, and you know, the, the Die Wolf's an incredible mech anyway. Now, there are there are two mechs that I would love. I would love the uh, Behemoth and the... Um, oh, name forgets me. Let me go and have a look at my sheet. It's the big one with the big claws. Um, I can't see it anywhere. The Kodiak. There he is. Um, that, the ad hoc star, uh, which is such a bizarre... A Fire Falcon, 25 tons. A Hellion, 30 tons. A Hollow, 20 tons. Uh, a Pack Hunter, 30 tons. And a Kodiak, 100 tons. Um, I, so what I might do is at some point I might try and like find a random code. I want one of the new models because they both look great. The new Stone Rhino, Behemoth, sorry, and the, the new Kodiak look great. I could go and buy the Ralph Parfum model now if I wanted to, but I don't want the packs because, the, again, I'm not... I don't like these like version 2 variants as well. I, in fact, the, the, I'll, I'll forgive it for the clans because these were created when they were in exile, so like they upgraded the Marauder to their version of the Marauder 2, so that does make sense. Um, but the fact that, again, I still think it's lazy. I still think that the game designers should have used their own specific mechs for it, but hey-ho. So, yeah, I'm not interested about any of those, really, but I would love the, the, the Stone Rhino, Behemoth, or the Kodiak. So, not much to say here, and I'm running out of time now anyway. So, hey-ho, the list is there if you if you ever want to have a look. Um, I've The only thing I'd say is I've decided that I want to run, uh, to give the options for the for four of the clans that I've chosen. So that was um, Clan Wolf, Jade Falcon, Ghost Bear, and Smoke Jaguar. I wanted to give them at least two stars to be able to run. So each clan has got 10 mechs. And very importantly, I wanted to do two evil clans. So that's like Jade Falcon and Smoke Jaguar. They're both evil. There's no denying that. And then there are two like nice clans or nicer clans in, in Clan Wolf and Clan Ghost Bear. So that, in terms of the law, the Ghost Bear and... and um, wolf or what you call warden clans so they were had a very like more liberal approach to the the inner sphere and didn't necessarily want to go and smash it up whereas jade falcon and smoke jaguar were, were basically jackbooted fascists so says all you need to know about those two next up and there's only two more tops to show and i'm, I'm gonna 
basically wrap this up very shortly because there's not much to say now. The the Dusk Haunters, who are my mercenary outfit, um, I've given them a couple of non-mech options here. So that's the the Infiltrator Mark II, which is basically like an uh, one of the I had like an extra um, elemental uh, point, so I just painted it purple and was like, oh yeah, that can be. You know, if I play like very late era stuff for me, because I, I don't play anything past the Fedcom Civil War, then the Dusk Counters have got a, a battle armor option. Awesome. Uh, I gave them a warrior attack helicopter as well, completely needlessly, but just because I wanted them to have the option of having something that flew. And I'm not going to go through all the mechs here, but it's a mixture of clan mechs and... Um, traditional like, inner sphere mechs because I wanted to give them that option. I the leader of the Dusk Counters is like a bit of an obsessive when it comes to lost tech. So he would see something like the the Thor and be like, that's amazing. Right. So they've kind of uh, so, um, most of my units do that. I mean most of my units don't have the option of, you know, they don't have factories delivering orders to them. They'll get what they can get and they've you know, they get it through salvage. So it's like as they go through the the clan invasion, they'll I'll be able to kind of play these on the grounds that either if I play like the proper campaign rules and you come across a, a dire wolf, then that unlocks the dire wolf if you blow it up because you get it as salvage. So it depends how I want to play that in like a narrative sense. Um, but yeah, they, they, I've got one old model here as well, which is the Lancelot. I love the Lancelot. Such a god. They actually, they, there is a new model of it in the Comstar pack, but I love the old model because it's so silly. It's got these tiny little skinny legs and these two like flappy arms. I love it. Um, also, the, the kind of narrative fluff that I've written for the Dusk Counters in the past, uh, the, a Lancelot is quite important to that lore, so that's why he's in there. The Catapult's also super important because the Catapult is my like uh, mech leader's uh, mech of choice. So, And I love the Catapult. The Catapult is probably my favourite mech, so it's no surprise that that's the mech that my um, like mercenary captain uses. And finally, and this is the end, because this is, but this is quite an important thing, but then I'll wrap the video up, is, and I'm going to say this categorically, I don't think there's any debate on this, write down your paint schemes. I'll repeat that, write down your paint schemes, because you will forget. And if, like me, you use, like, the Citadel range, where there are, like, hundreds of them, and they all, there are, like, different variants of green, you end up, like, I don't know, dipping into it and, and painting half your lance like the, the wrong color and you'll be like oh no then there are military units and they don't look uniform now i've kind of kept the now that's me because i'm quite fastidious like I, I allow myself to get really silly with like the pirates and the local government forces but on the whole these are military forces so they should look quite uniform I've kept them pretty boring. I mean, they've literally, there's like a primary, secondary, third color scheme there. So you don't really see anything beyond that. Um, but I do use like, you know, I use shades and I'm, I don't, I don't, I never dry brush anything. I use like a, a, a sponge to kind of dab like little bits. So, you know, like where like uh, paint's been, um, I don't know, like ripped off or like it's been like if the mech's fallen over or something like that, they shouldn't look clean if they're like on the battlefield. They should be dirty. They should look grimy. They should have like paint stripped off them. So I use quite a lot of colours on them, but they're the kind of three colour schemes that I'll be using for each faction. It's not set in stone. It's just, um, that's my thoughts on it now. I only use Citadel uh, paints because I'm so familiar with them. I know there are there are better ones on the market, I'd imagine. Um, but that's uh, I know what where I stand with it, and they're easy to get in Britain, and they are pretty expensive for what you give. They're very expensive for what you get, but I'm fine with that. I'm still, you know, I, I I'd rather have what I know because I'm not the greatest painter on earth, and I know that I can like thin them paints. I know how to do it. I don't have to kind of get another color range where the pigments might be slightly different and it's kind of confusing my technique so I just do whatever you are used to and, and need and want to do but again it's that the, the reason I've chosen these specific colors is because it reflects the uh, faction which is quite a boring thing to do in fact it's a very boring thing to do if you wanted to do your if you wanted to run something like this where you are choosing multiple uh like factions the best way to do it if you're if you're getting into it, like you'll find a, a battalion or something like that, that you really like read a book and you'll find like a, I don't know, a Draconis combine, um, 
military unit that you really like and they're painted up in a very particular way it might be like red and green or something like that and then you can reflect that that's the way more interesting way to do it but because i want to introduce new people to this game i want to be able to say to them okay you like blue you'll probably like the lyran commonwealth because they're they're playing blue um, i'm even painting them in mccrag blue which is like the ultramarines blue so they are like the you know the real i suppose poster boys for this to some extent given that they rock assault max and they're they're easy to paint as well with the lyrans so you know you that's why i've done this specifically because if my if i've got a friend over and they're playing with the lyrans and that's associated with blue max and i've painted them up green and white not that it's going to confuse them because they're not dumb but i mean it will be like it's slightly weird like i and, and you know i want them to gravitate towards it because that will get them into the game like if they love red and white and they like the look of the taurians and they play the taurians it might give them impetus, impetus to go and buy a couple of lance packs and paint things up red and white or they can look into the taurians read a book about the taurians and then decide they're going to use their battalion for it but i'm like i said i'm the kind of touchstone right so like you come to me, you play one random game, and then it, you get a full... F I can then, you know, I can give like a 10-minute treatise on what the clans are, what the inner sphere is, uh, who are the major powers, who are the minor powers, that kind of thing, and that's reflected quite nicely in the um, in the paint scheme there. Anyway, I think that's it. So, to conclude, I'd say do something like this or try it out. It adds a different dimension to your hobby, it also, like, it can really prompt you as well to do it. Because if you've got it written down and you can see, like, clear objectives, like, for instance, if I go to the uh, clan section now, I'm seeing, like, okay, I've cl I've painted all Jade Falcon, right? And that's, like, and I've painted, I've got some, like, I've painted one elemental um, point for, for Clan Wolf. But, and that's probably the next thing that I'll paint. And I'm not going to be satisfied until all that becomes, you know, like, painted out because it, my excel sheet's not complete uh, and i know it sounds really like lizard brain and weird but to an extent it gives you that impetus to do it because you are like constantly up against those three factors the money the time and the space this helps you reflect that and at the end of it you're going to have a very nice lovely completed project i won't go too deep into it i mean you don't have to unless you're a competitive player you might have to do some number crunching um which you might be able to do through excel i personally I think I can do some of that, but there are like elaborate things you can do to see what percentages. So my table's squeaking. Um, if that's picking up on the microphone. Um, so you know, like just like have a think about something like this is this is like it's not project management. It's like one hundred and one organizational skill. Show you what you've paint. Keep track of your color schemes. Keep track of the finances. If you're going to be a, like a fluff player or a law player, like I am rather than just like picking up a box and be like i'm gonna paint all these capellans and it's actually like a an entire lance of assault max now now or, or worse clan max because then the people are going to be very confused i say that with a caveat though because battletech's very relaxed so you you know you can kind of do what you want but if you are going to introduce people to the game or you want to play stuff that like is reflective of the things that you're reading and the things that you're looking at then something like this is super useful because there is so much in BattleTech and gives you a real kind of like introduction to the lore as well because I had to actively like there were certain mechs I was like I have no idea who makes that mech so I had to actively like look it up do a bit of research on it I was like oh okay and then I read the article about it or whatever online I was like oh that's really interesting it's quite an interesting thing to think about so it gives you that like a little bit more like you know bang for your bucks when you're getting into a hobby i think something like this it will kind of force you down paths that you might not necessarily gravitate towards so yeah it's a good idea uh, it's completely harmless it's really quick and easy to do you can make it as complex or easy as you want but it will again it will help you manage those three factors money time and space and on that, I think I am going to end this video. So thank you very much for watching and I'll hopefully catch you next time.